Hello everyone, and welcome, finally, to Presidio Bay. Before we start, thank you to all our patrons, collaborators, and viewers for sticking with us throughout the full year since the first reveal. We couldn't do this without you, so thank you. Presidio Bay is a city skyline series covering about 150 years in time. While our series officially starts in 1906, first we need to go back a little farther. We've prepared a short film to help get you up to speed. Presidio Bay was formed by earthquakes and sea level rise. Eons ago, the land between the San Andreas and Hayward Faults sunk. When the glaciers of the Ice Age melted, the Pacific Ocean rose and filled in this valley. This created a bay that, surrounded by fault-lift mountains, had many microclimates full of a variety of plant and animal life. It was about this same time, 10,000 years ago, that First Nation peoples began to settle around the bay. Eventually, around a dozen tribes formed, including the Ohlone, Miwok, Ramaytush, and Chochenyo, Together, these tribes formed one of the largest human settlements north of Mexico. In the late 1700s, Spanish invaders found the bay by accident while trying to get to the nearby colonial outpost. Spanish rule was harsh, manifested in two institutions, the Mission and the Presidio. The missions were extensions of the state religion, Catholicism and their leaders forced First Nations peoples to convert to Christianity and to labor for them. The Presidios, meanwhile, were small military installations that, at least on paper, projected the imperial power of Spain. As for the land that once belonged to First Nations peoples, it was divided up into enormous ranchos for farming and raising livestock. The Spanish crown gave away these lands to its loyal supporters. After Mexico declared independence from Spain in the 1820s, the mission system was broken up and forced conversions of natives ended, but the ranchos remained in control of colonial settlers. In 1846, the United States, seeking to claim additional territory, provoked Mexico into a war. While most fighting took place elsewhere, the U.S. prevailed and Presidio Bay became American territory. Following conquest, the incoming stream of white settlers was constant, only growing after the discovery of gold in 1849 and the creation of the new state of Costa Noa in 1850. Ranchos, once securely controlled by Mexican colonists, were infringed upon by American squatters, tying them up for decades-long legal battles. Gold seekers brought enormous demand for the necessities of mining from pans and picks to liquor and illicit entertainment. Fields became camps, camps became villages, and villages became ramshackled, hammered together instant towns. Queen of them all was Santa Isadora. In less than a decade, the swampy, disease-ridden settlement around the abandoned Mission Isadora exploded into the largest city on the west coast. With more than 300,000 people, the city was a bustling hub of banking, trade, and nightlife, rivaling the size of major cities on the East Coast. To build it, nearby redwood groves were harvested at an alarming rate. This wooden city, lit by oil lamps, burned down eight times over the next 50 years, with two of these fires started during earthquakes. 
If Santa Isadora was founded on mining money, it was transportation and finance that built it into power. Among the most powerful Santa Isadoras were the Big Four, a quartet of small-time merchants who became fabulously wealthy by investing in a railroad and pushing out its visionary founder. This was the Transcontinental Railroad, the Coast Range, with its vast land grants and lucrative construction contracts. With determination, sweat, exploited foreign labor, and a little bit of fraud, the Big Four turned the deadly months-long trek from the east into a safe and simple four-day train trip, a feat that Amtrak barely manages to beat to this day. But the Coast Range was more than a railroad. It was the state's largest landowner and the state's largest financier of political careers. This included an early legal precedent of the corporations as people argument, when in 1886, a South Bay judge ruled that the Equal Protections Clause of the 14th Amendment applied to corporations. This allowed the railroad to weasel out of some taxes that they probably weren't going to pay anyway. While the Coast Range thus funneled people and goods to Santa Isadora, it also funneled wealth, power, and prestige to the city. Soon, the city outgrew its confines, creating new land by filling the bay with anything it could get its hands on, including the hulls of damaged ships and converting its vast sand dunes into buildable lots. The global financial collapse of 1893 put Santa Isadora's growth on pause, but only briefly. By the spring of 1906, things were once again looking up, with the city's downtown bigger and busier than ever. Cable cars and streetcars stretched further and further. Downtown buildings got taller and taller. As ever, Santa Isadora bustled with energy, and the Miles Brothers, local cinema pioneers, captured that energy on film on April 15, 1906. It is just four days later where our story of Presidio Bay begins. It's April 18, 1906, just after 5 a.m. An earthquake measuring 7.9 on the Richter scale struck the city. Shaking lasted for almost a minute and was felt from as far south as Los Angeles and as far north as Portland, or in city skylines terms, from Springwood to Aramore. In the end, the San Andreas Fault tore a 500-mile gash in the state of Costanoa, and the two sides were offset in places by almost 20 feet. The earthquake immediately damaged hundreds of blocks of the city. Office towers, department stores, and hotels crumbled. Smaller buildings, usually made of wood, were more flexible and often survived the initial disaster. In a handful of neighborhoods, built on landfill, the soil gave way and liquefied, and in some cases, entire blocks sank a full story into the ground. The immediate aftermath of the earthquake was total pandemonium. Aftershocks collapsed already damaged buildings and streets were strewn with debris. Ruptured gas lines and smashed oil lamps ignited both furniture and wooden buildings, setting fire to what had survived the shaking. It was a one-two punch to the city. In desperation, many tried to rescue their valuables before their homes collapsed or burned. In a vain attempt to maintain control and to prevent looting, the mayor gave the police a shoot-to-kill order. Panicky police officers and soldiers sometimes opened fire on citizens who were trying to help friends and protect their belongings. Firefighters staggered out of their firehouses and began working to put out the blaze. It seemed a futile task. While earthquakes and fires weren't new experiences, none had ever been this bad. The city's modern system of water pipes and fire hydrants depended on underground pipes made of terracotta, a reliable but brittle material. The earthquake shattered much of it, taking almost every fire hydrant in the city out of service. In the area of the city where the fires burned strongest, only one single fire hydrant kept working. This famous golden hydrant survives today near Dolores Park and is still in use. The rest of the city, without any water, and with the streets strewn with rubble, debris, and dead bodies, didn't go so well. Many fires began as accidents. One of the largest was the so-called ham and eggs fire that began when someone tried to cook breakfast on a damaged stove. The fire eventually spread, burning the remains of City Hall and the Hall of Records. Around 8 p.m., long after the start of several other fires, a new blaze began at a restaurant in the heart of the city. This fire, likely an arson, overwhelmed the already overstretched fire department, who watched powerlessly as downtown and Knob Hill were destroyed. Without water and rushing to contain the fire, the fire department decided to sacrifice parts of the city to create fire breaks. 
By blowing up a line of buildings, it would create a gap in flammable material that would be difficult for the fire to cross. At the time, this seemed like a great idea. After all, the city's fire chief had been a big proponent of the use of dynamite to contain large fires. His plan ended up having a few problems, the first of which being that the fire chief, with his expertise in precision demolitions, had died in the earthquake when a hotel had fallen on him. Without expert oversight, untrained firefighters, soldiers, and volunteers grabbed whatever explosives they could find, from actual dynamite and mining charges to straight up black powder. The army even brought artillery shells. The closest thing to a demolitions expert in the area was Captain John Birmingham, a locomotive engineer turned ship captain turned demolition company executive who showed up to volunteer for help. This normally would have been very useful expertise, except that Birmingham was extremely drunk. He managed to set more than 50 additional fires with his explosives in Chinatown and North Beach. The black powder charges brought by the army failed on two fronts. For larger brick buildings, they blew out windows, sending shards of glass flying, but not taking down the building. For wooden buildings, the gunpowder ignited the wood as it exploded, creating dozens of additional fires as burning debris rained down on nearby structures. A full 24 hours after the initial earthquake, fires still raged in many parts of the city. Field hospitals were set up in the Presidio and Golden Gate Park, quickly filling up with victims of injuries, trauma, burns, and smoke inhalation. The military, with a strong presence in the Bay Area, responded quickly. Even as the fires burned, the Army managed to reconnect telegraph service to the ferry building, using it to coordinate help. Navy ships up and down the coast immediately steamed towards the Bay, hoping to help in any way they can. Many of these ships, along with hundreds of civilian vessels, helped evacuate more than 20,000 people from the city in the largest maritime evacuation until Dunkirk in 1940. The railroads, including the Coast Range, rushed in to help as well. Damage to rail lines was surprisingly limited, especially east of the bay, allowing railroads to remain in service. In the four days following the quake, more than 700 trains and countless ferries moved hundreds of thousands of people out of the city, free of charge. In the week following the earthquake, it's estimated that more than half of Santa Isidora's population was evacuated by rail. In total, around 3,000 people lost their lives in the earthquake and fires. 28,000 buildings were destroyed, and property damages were in excess of $10.5 billion when adjusted for inflation. Almost a quarter million inhabitants were left homeless, and more than 75,000 of these refugees would never return to the city. Downtown Santa Isadora was a wasteland. Miraculously, the ferry building survived, and thanks to the incredible efforts of the Navy's fireboats, most of the waterfront piers managed to stay intact as well. Further down Market Street, the Call Building, Santa Isadora's tallest, had been gutted but stayed standing. The unfinished Fairmont Hotel was reduced to a hollow shell. One of the grand mansions atop Knob Hill avoided destruction, the House of James Flood. Although its interior burned, the Connecticut brownstone walls remained intact. One of the city's notable landmarks, the 1899 built City Hall, was almost completely destroyed, thankfully saving us a huge commission. When the aftershocks stopped and the fires burned out, the exhausted city faced yet another challenge, how to begin again. If you like this episode, want first access to future episodes, or would like early access to the custom assets used in Presidio Bay, please consider joining our Patreon. Every dollar put in goes directly into improving the series, from custom assets, to in-depth research, to helping with the cost of making these videos. For as little as one dollar a month, you can be part of making Presidio Bay a success. Join at patreon.com slash Presidio Bay. And remember to subscribe here for more videos, asset creation streams, and other updates. You can follow me on Twitter at interurban underscore e and besquigglehausen at besquiggle. Our next episode will be on my channel, Interurban Era. The link is in the description. Don't forget to head over there to continue the story. Before we go, we'd like to extend our gratitude to the incredible Tom Coletti, at Tom Coletti on Twitter, for the fantastic Presidio Bay theme music. And of course, thank you to all of our patrons for making this series possible. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on Presidio Bay.